Hi everyone. I can see that people are starting to come into the presentation. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Leslie Hendrickson. I am on the steering committee of the Newburyport Literary Festival. I just have a couple of things to tell you before I introduce our author. The first thing is we're using a webinar format, so you're not going to see your self, you'll only see the presenters. The presentation is going to last about 30 minutes and there will be time for questions at the end. You can use the Q&A uh, thread down at the bottom of your Zoom screen and to ask your questions. Also in the chat box, you will find links to the Newburyport Literary Festival website, which has more information about our authors, as well as links to our independent bookshops the Bookshop of Beverly Farms and Jabberwocky in Newburyport. They have all the books from our festival and we encourage you to support them or your local bookstore. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dyke Hendrickson. Dyke, thank you so much for being here. Dyke? Well, thank you, Leslie. Thank you for introducing me. Um, I'm Dyke Hendrickson, I'm an author and a journalist. And uh, from about 2011 to 2018 or so, I was with the Daily News here in Newburyport. And I became, I covered the waterfront and I became interested in the waterfront, uh, the history of the waterfront. And I wrote a book called North Cole Newburyport. That was, came out several years ago. Recently, I've kept up my great interest in the waterfront. And I've written a book titled um, New England Coast Guard stories, Remarkable Mariners. This is about the first responders who are on the water. We see them. And um, it was just, I went from Northern Maine to Southern Connecticut interviewing Coasties and finding out what their lives were like. Now there have been numerous books about the Coast Guard. I think mine is the first one that actually talks to the Coasties. And um, you know, why did you join? Have you been in harm's way? Can you ha have a family? Um, so I, it's a lot about the people, as you'll soon see. So one of the staples of what we have in New England is the buoy tender. Here's a 175-foot Abbey Burgess. This is Rockland, Maine. Buoy tenders are very important. They keep the buoys in the harbors. A lot of them are closing. Buoy tenders are very valuable. Here's another um, element that sometimes we see in New England. This is uh, a exercise to let a swimmer down into the water. Now we will get into the fact that swimmers do go into the water. When the bounty sank um, in 2012, there was swimmers every day saving 14 or 16 people from the bounty. But you can see um, physical condition is important, timing's conditioning, timing's important, and this is um, a wonderful photo. Massachusetts, um, the ship Massachusetts was built in Newburyport. It was the first ship for the revenue cutter service because the, in 1789, when the revolution was over, General Washington went to uh, Alexander Hamilton and said, we're broke, uh, we need money, and Hamilton said, well, fine, let's have a revenue cutter service. We'll, we'll make sure that the ships coming into New England harbors pay their duties and we'll also stop smuggling. So and Alexander Hamilton was the father of the Coast Guard and it's believed to be started here because the Massachusetts was built right here in Newburyport. It was the first one built in 1790 and launched in 1791. This is a monument right down on the waterfront in Newburyport, which recognizes the fact that Newburyport is the birthplace of the Coast Guard. Uh, Newburyport's waterfront has improved over the years. This came in several years ago. This is a wonderful uh, memorial to fishermen who have died, say, in the last two decades, local young men who um, their ships were lost at sea. Beyond that is the um, the harbor master's headquarters, but this is the Merrimack River. This is, you know, ground zero for a lot of activity. And um, it, they certainly did a beautiful job on the memorial. We were talking briefly about the bounty. This was a ship built in 1960 for the 
movie Mutiny on the Bounty. After that, it was a tourist site in numerous spots. And in 2012, in the fall, it was going from Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, down to uh, Florida, so it could be a tourist attraction once again. It got into a lot of trouble, though, and uh, it was in a hurricane. Here is Captain Robin Waldridge, uh, the captain of the vessel. Um, he was about 62. He took a long time to call the Coast Guard, and it's unfortunate because two lives were lost. 16 people were on the vessel, and 14 were saved by the Coast Guard. Here is Claudine Christian, the other individual who did not survive. Um, she was from California. She was about 42. She was actually a relative of Fletcher Christian, who is known from the Mutiny and the Bounty as a character in that saga. Her body was recovered. She was rushed to the hospital, but she did not survive. She had been on the ship kind of as a avocation, a recreation, um, and thought she would do it, you know, for fun. But um, she was unable to get off the ship alive and uh, did not survive when she was brought to the shore. One of my sources as I wrote the book, because I wrote quite a bit about the bounty, was Jane Pena, who was sleeping happily in a Coast Guard barracks in North Carolina when at 5 a.m. call came and said there's a, a ship, you know, sink off North Carolina coast. And so she, you know, I said, what was the first thing she did? And she said, well, we all went online. We saw what it looked like. We hadn't heard of it. We didn't know there was going to be a ship out in a hurricane. And so she and a group went out there to save them. This is actually a, a true photo of that rescue. They did save 14 or 16, and this is the chopper uh, that we, um, this is the exercise we looked at. And so here's someone going into the water and it was fortunate because two lifeboats had taken the 14 people up, but the lifeboats had tops over them. So the water wasn't coming in so readily. And so they could get to the people um, in a fairly significant way. Here's a picture of what we just thought about. This isn't actually from that rescue, but this shows what it looks like. You're lowering a swimmer down, you have people in the water, and as I understand it, <clears throat> when the swimmer got to one of the lifeboats, he looked in, he opened up the little canvas gate, looked in and said rather drolly, I understand some of you people want to ride back to shore. So here you have these people, they're scared, they're cold, they don't know if they're gonna live, and this guy says, geez, I understand someone wants to ride back to shore. Well, let me get my hand up. <laughs> when we talk about rescues, and the Coast Guard has been at it for a long time, um, rescuing started several, two centuries ago, actually, and, and Plum Island, which is off of Newburyport, has had many rescues. Here is one, this is an incredible um, photo taken in 1892. Now the Humane Society started in this area in 1788. They started rescuing people. This is a century later, and this is a terrific photo, but this is the way it looked like when crews would go out. Coming up a little in years, this was a famous rescue. The Coast Guard was involved in off Cape Cod in about 1952. It was made into a movie, The Finest Hours. Be a little more likely to happen. A Coast Guard uh, vessel comes along, a disabled pleasure cruiser. Now, the Coast Guard doesn't haul in many vessels anymore. Since 9-11, they're much more interested in security. So if they came to this vessel and say there was a, you know, they ran out of gas or they lost their tiller, they would call something like Tow USA. But here's an example of what the Coast Guard does frequently. When talking about life saving, life savers, we always want to have an old salt. And this is about as salty as it gets. Joshua James, a native of Hull, Massachusetts in 19th century, uh, saved hundreds of lives down there. And he certainly was got a medals for doing good work. Newport, Rhode Island, Ida Lewis saved many um, people. She had grown up on 
in a lighthouse. Her family ran the lighthouse. And so she became one of the leading lifesavers in the uh, Rhode Island area. And here's a, um, a painting of what it may have looked like. It might be a little romanticized, but um, this is Ida Lewis, uh, a famous photo of her as she was trying to give help to people in the water. This is a little administrational. The Coast Guard wasn't known as the Coast Guard until about 1915. Um, the Revenue Service merged with the Life Saving Service and Sumner uh, Kimball helped that happen. So that was 1915. In 1939, the Lighthouse Service was added. So 1915 was the first time the Coast Guard was mentioned. 1939, they also took on the Lighthouse Service and that's how we have our modern Coast Guard. Going back in time and chronologically, there weren't many women in the Coast Guard, but here were the first, two of the first. They were twins. They worked clerically in Washington, D.C. And I love this photo. It's one of the earliest photos of women in the Coast Guard. Moving up in years as we are, um, one of the busiest times for the Coast Guard was during Prohibition, which was from 1920 to 1933. And here's a vessel on the left carrying a great deal of uh, liquor and whatever stopped by Coast Guard vessels, which are on the right. Um, in Newburyport, right off of Plum Island, there was a, a very tragic event in 1929 when two Coast Guard vessels were firing at a rum runner and um, a Coastie was killed by friendly fire. And so it was a dangerous business, um, perhaps like the drug running is today. But during Prohibition, the Coast Guard had a lot to do. Oh no, it seems like the connection for Dyke Hendrickson has been lost. Hopefully he can call back in. Here we are. Hi, hi Dyke, can you start? Hello. All right, you can, I think we can drop the phone call now. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I actually also have your, um, presentation online. So maybe I'll try and share it and we'll go through the second half quickly. Does that sound good? So I'm okay, that would be great. Yeah, great. Doing that now. Um, that's me in Alaska, everybody on a kayak. So were we past this, Dad? Yeah. Keep going by the old salt and old Ida. Salt. This one? Ida. Well, the old guy. Here. Keep going past him. Oh, past, past the women. Yep. Where should we start? Yeah, we're right here. Okay. So, um, so Megan Cahoon was the only, she was up in Rockland, Maine. She was the only woman of 33 Coasties up there. But she said things went pretty well. And uh, they, they, had, they don't live in dorms. She had her own place. And so she was interesting to talk to. Next. Can you get to next? Yep. Do you, do you want me to do it or do you want no, to I'll do it? I'll do it. Okay. So Commander Karen Kukowitz was an admiral's aide in Washington, was very, in Boston, was very helpful to me. And at first I had trouble interviewing people because they said, you know, does, he, does my boss know I'm talking to you or, you know, is this okay? And so as it turned out, um, she was very helpful. When I saw her, she was in Boston, then she shipped out of Alabama and now she's in Alaska. There's a lot of moving done in, uh, in the service. Okay, next. Well, Commander Valerie Boyd was in New Haven when I met her. She had worked with Katrina in 2005, very difficult. And then uh, the Coast Guard did a terrific job at Katrina with 24,000 they saved and aided about 9,000. So at the end of the interview, I said, is there anything that you would mention? And she said, well, during the last 10 years, I managed to have two children and they're doing great. My husband and I are making a career in the Coast Guard. So in addition to everything else, she had a couple of kids and is doing well. 
token. This was um, represented, uh, Rear Admiral Stephen Poulin is on the right. He was leaving to take a bigger position um, in the southern states, and he was leaving to, to Rear Admiral Tungenson to the left. And it's a big deal when there are changes over, and uh, the Admiral Poulin helped me a great deal when I was uh, trying to do things. Okay. So Lieutenant Commander Rob Craighead called me up after Nautical Newburyport and said, can you come down and, and talk or at least meet me? I love the book. And of course, as an author, I was thrilled that he liked it. And I said, why are you so interested? Okay. And he said, I was commanding that particular vessel that's on the cover of your book. Okay. So this is on the cover of Nautical Newburyport. And he was the one who was at the helm. And as you can see, it was high seas. Um, everyone strapped in, no one was lost, but you know, this was only a practice, but it was, <laughs> it was a pretty vigorous practice, I would say, okay? And here is um, Escanaba, a vessel that goes and finds drugs in the, in, you know, off of Florida and off of the Caribbean. It has a crew of about a hundred. And um, when I put this on my Facebook page, you know, I must tell you, no one ever looks at my Facebook page but I got like 800 um, connections and 500 likes. In other words, they really appreciated what the Coast Guard people do, um, and such as this ship going down, you know, stopping drugs and, and helping immigrants uh, who are trying to, you know, if they're going into the sea or whatever, it's very helpful. Okay. The Coast Guard Academy is in New London, Connecticut. Actually, you can see uh, the eagle at the top of the picture. Um, they started taking women in 1986, and so the first classes were about 1990. And last class they had, um, had 40% women in the Coast Guard Academy starting out. So there are about 42,000 people in the Coast Guard, that counts reserves, auxiliary, and actives, and about maybe, I'd say about 7,000 are women. So the women are having a larger place, it's taking time, um, but they're, you know, doing great and um, the change is happening and the ones that I met, I like it very much. Okay. Can you change it? Okay. So here's our final slide and thank you very much for sticking with us, everybody. Um, we just had a crash, but, you know, like the Coast Guard, Semper Paratus, always ready, <laughs> if I can use the term. This is Newburyport. Um, there are about 26 coasties stationed there. And so uh, they don't stay overnight. They have their own places in town. But I understand Newburyport's one of the most popular uh, postings because it's near to the town. You can walk through the town. You can go fishing, boating, and whatever. And so Newburyport is a very popular place to be. So those are some of the slides that I wanted to show you. They're all in the book. The book came out in mid-March. and um, so if you're interested in more, please, uh, you know, look for it at Jabberwocky or Beverly Farms. And if there are questions, and thank you for hanging with us. And Leslie also, thank you for, for uh, putting this together. Yes, thank you, um, Dad. Good, good coming back. Um, and we appreciate you can make it back. Um, so we do have a couple questions. For starters, what was the most surprising thing that you learned when you were researching this book? I think um, one of the most surprising was how well women have integrated into the Coast Guard. There were some rough years in the early 90s. Right now, it's a great um, career spot for a lot of women, either officers or enlisted. They do every kind of job there is. And also they're able to develop you know, families as well, as I think you saw. So the fact that women are integrating in or being extremely successful and effective, you know, was very refreshing and good for me to learn. And um, does the Maritime Museum in Newburyport still have a walking tour that includes a visit to the Coast Guard, do you know? Yeah, that's a good question. On August 4th, which is the Coast Guard's anniversary when, from its founding, they have an open house at the, the Newburyport station. There's a walking tour. There are two 47-footers that um, are available for people to 
get on and inspect. Oh, I know, the, the other thing that surprised me with these 47 footers I just mentioned, if it rolls over in high seas, it'll come back up on its correct, correct heading. In other words, everybody will be fine. And the, and the engine will still be running. <laughs> so I was quite amazed by this, but I did meet somebody who was taking out a cadet and the cadet did a poor job. He rolled the vessel, but it did come up right side up. It was still running. And I said to the captain, well, how did the trip go home, home go? And he said, that poor cadet was so embarrassed and so mortified. I just patted him on the back and said, look, you can do this again. We're all safe and just try to forget and do better the next time. So it was surprising to find out the great capability of the 47 footer. <laughs> Do most people in the Coast Guard come from the Graduate Academy? Or do they have to go through the Academy? No, and the officers go through the Academy, usually, or there is OCS. There is also for enlisted people in Cape May, New Jersey, there is a very large area where enlisted people go. And, you know, it's eight or 10 weeks, just like, say, the Army or the Navy. It's boot camp. And the one thing about, um, being an officer in the Coast Guard, it is to get into the Coast Guard Academy. It's the only military academy where you do not need a congressional um, pass to get there. In other words, you don't need a political pull. You can apply and get in on your own merits, unlike Annapolis or West Point, where you need a congressional appointment. How have the tasks of the Coast Guard changed over the years? And, you know, starting obviously with revenue, and now they're looking for drugs and terrorists and, um, you know, have a different kind of role. So how has that changed and evolved? Well, one of, that's a good question. One of the largest roles, it is the first responder to maritime spills, oil spills or environmental disasters. The Coast Guard has to be on the scene. They're trained in chemistry and and many other areas. So this is the lead force in, um, in environment. And you know, in New England, it's very important if you have a spill in a river or um, you have any of these type of situations, the Coast Guard is the key responder to that and they get the whole thing going. How many Coast Guard helicopters are there on the East Coast, do you know, and where are they stationed? I think, I think there's about four dozen on the East Coast. There's um, uh, three or four at Woods Hole, I believe. They used to be in Salem, Massachusetts, um, but no longer. And there's, you know, many in Florida. Um, helicopters came in I th in 1941, 1942. They were developed by Sikorsky in Connecticut and have been very valuable, as you just saw with the bounty. Um, when the bounty was sighted by a plane, but a plane can't stop, obviously, so it got the position of the bounty. It was radioed that to the helicopters, so they started out. So the choppers have become a very valuable element of the Coast Guard. Um, well, we are almost out of time, unfortunately, because we have another event at noon, but I wanted to ask you what you're working on now and how we can find copies of your book. So what I'm working on now is called Merrimack, the Resilient River. It's a history of the Merrimack River. Uh, many big things happened. The Coast Guard started here. The Industrial Revolution started here. The science of clean drinking water started here. So there's a lot of, and, and the labor movement started here. A lot of huge things happen on the Merrimack. It'll be my third book involving local waters, and I'm calling it my Merrimack Trilogy. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on that now. It's um, due out next year. And um, for this book, for, you know, for the Coast Guard book, um, it's at Jabberwock and you say Beverly Farms, it's available there. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dad. It was really great. I'm sorry we had the connectivity issues in the uh, middle, but thanks all to, to our participants as well for hanging in there. And um, yeah, it was a great talk. Thank you so much. And I could say this, Leslie, to appropriate Semper Paratus, always ready. <laughs> it looks like it's always ready because we could have had a bad moment. I mean, losing me wouldn't have been that much, but it, it could have been a glitch. But you got together. The festival got it together. Thank you very much. We also will have recordings available in the next couple of days, and we'll um, do a, 
a little bit of an edit job so you can see this recording <laughs> in full. And um, you're also going to be teaching this class through New Report lit Literary, um, through the, uh, sorry, through Adult Ed, right? right. Yeah, through Adult Education in mid-June. There's going to be a two-part class. The first is on the Coast Guard, and the second part is on the Merrimack River. And people are concerned about the river now because it seems to be getting dirtier, not cleaner. So that'll be a two-part class for adult education in mid-June, and that will be on the adult education page. Great. So we'll um, we'll look forward to that. And thank you again. Thanks to everybody, and have a great day. Thank you for staying with us.